Um, okay, so the future of radio. Wow, there, there's so much. Um, in fact, the the, the Geocron folks, um, they, they may end up being part of that, but I, I will save that for a future discussion. But I will say right away regarding weather here on Earth and the ionosphere here on Earth, the upper atmosphere where, where you know, we all do skywave, right? We rely on that upper atmosphere to be able to do skywave and HF and DXing and, and all of that. There is no good way right now to do the predictions for that type of forecasting. Um, the ionosphere, the upper atmosphere is so complicated that any model that we have right now that could even become, that could even approach trying to predict the way the, that upper atmosphere is going to be, and the layers are, and all that kind of thing. Those models are so slow uh, that they could never do it in real time, let alone future time, faster than real time. So predictions right now of the ionosphere is, are basically out the window. And really what we're kind of locked into are now casts. But we don't, up until recently, we really didn't have a great way of doing now casting. But now with things like the WhisperNet and, you know, PSK Reporter, right, reverse beacon network, and now even the GPS and the GNSS databases at higher frequencies, higher radio frequencies, we actually are getting to a point where we can start doing now casting of ionospheric prop, uh, propagation conditions. But it hasn't been implemented on a wide scale yet, let alone implemented in, on a scale that where we could actually start impacting how science is done how future science is done and how future models are created and, and what scientists learn in terms of understanding our upper atmosphere. So here at Earth, that is a huge way how radio, uh, just amateur radio, is going to be of monster use coming in the next decade, I would say in this new solar cycle. Because there are so a lot of scientists it, already taking, taking note of that. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. So, so what I wanted to ask was when you were saying that, so... Um, a lot of times what people do for predictive analytics is they look at historical patterns and trends. And they say that when these conditions read these numbers, then we can expect this kind of behavior. When you're talking about now casting, <clears throat> you're talking about the ability to take a look at real time analytics and say that this is this is what we're seeing now and then give a more accurate prediction. Is that right? Yes, because what you're talking about prior to that is more like climatology. And it's like saying, you know, instead of looking at the what is the weather today, it's like, well, what was the weather last year at this time? And saying, well, then that's what the weather is going to be like today, because last year at this time or over the last few years, we average it. And that's what the you know, we're going to say that's what our weather is at the moment. That's about how well we can do with with the ionosphere, um, you know, weather, so to speak. But that ends up really not being useful. Um, on a day-to-day -day because of the variability that's that's involved. That's why you can't really look at these some of these old climatological models and expect them to tell you what the ionosphere is going to do on any given day. Not to mention, you know, weather affects the ionosphere from below, and of course, space weather affects it from above. So you get this, you know, basically the ionosphere, the, the part of the upper atmosphere that we care about as, as amateur radio operators, it's the cream filling in an Oreo cookie, <laughs> where the wafer on top is the space weather the wafer on bottom is the the terrestrial weather and it's squeezing from both sides and squishing this oreo cream filling which is the middle so you never know what that is going to be like on it on any given day because there's just so much variability for both from above and from below um so that's going to change i think an amateur radio is going to to really help in that sense um so that's one I want me to to talk well, regarding, you know, first, you know, I I had sent you a, a that graphic of the little the chart that everybody always looks at and nobody understands that just says you know twenty meters is open and closed. C can we pull that up and kind of go through it first? Just because sure, several people me, okay. you know, several people have asked, you know, there I'll you pull go. That up. Let me, yeah, hang on one second. Let me do one of L I S I R D. I'm gonna pull up Solar Flux too here in a minute. This, this is how I'm fine if you go for a couple hours. Yeah, we'll we'll just kind of we'll, we'll, we'll just tell that. Josh. Get, we'll tell Josh. Get mad. <laughs> no, don't do that. Oh goodness, I'll be in trouble. Okay, so what we what we've done that they've asked me to pull up um, QRZ. So this is this is probably something that a lot of people use. Now, granted, 
the, there are a, a lot of different flavors of this, right? So, so sometimes you're actually looking at these and they're, um, they, they go way down. They've got like sporadic E and all this kind of stuff for VHF and meteor scatter. And there's a lot of more stuff than this. Um, also know that, that, uh, Paul, I think it is whose, whose data this is, N O N O N B H. Um, he's up, he's in the process of updating them. There's some stuff here that is completely out of, of use. Um, for example, and I'll just point to it right away. The 304 angstroms, see this 304 a that's 304 angstroms on Eve. So he has managed to update this one. Good thing. A couple of them will say on at SEM set the SEM, um, instrument on, on Soho. Uh, I think it was on, no, it was it on Soho or was it on Goes? I forget where the SEM instrument was located, but uh, if you see this saying SEM, S-E-M, instead of EVE, it's not working. So what what he's looking for in this particular ang uh, um, wavelength here of light is uh, the amount of extreme ultraviolet that is hitting our upper atmosphere and affecting mainly the F layer. So that's what really what they're looking at. And I think really what you need to look for um, is looking at uh, um, big changes. So when you see this number go sky high or in, in a short period of time, that's really when you're going to see the F layer get affected. And it may be going, um, it may be getting better or getting worse. It's hard to say. But know that this 304 angstrom number only matters on the day side of Earth, not the night side. Okay, so I'm going to just mention that right away, just because that's one of the biggest things that has yet to be kind of updated. All right, so let's talk from the top down. Sounds good. SFI, that's uh, that's solar flux, and I'll show you solar flux. Um, uh, I believe that's the solar flux index, seventy nine. Yeah, I think it's. I thought it was a little bit higher than that right now, but we'll we'll take a look. I'll show you penticton in, in a short bit, which is actually a plot of the day daily solar flux, so you can get a better idea. Um, so here is is the, the solar flux. So we're sitting in the marginal range. Anything above about 70 is the marginal range. Anything above about uh, 90, 95 is getting into the good range. So we're getting, we're creeping up, thank goodness, because solar minimum, we were in this like high 60s. So you can see we're continuing to creep up. Sunspot number, this is probably the smooth number um, because right now I think we only have one sunspot on the earth facing disc and this says 12. So this is a monthly smooth number. Uh, that's why it, there's you got to be careful when you look at that. Um, but it's showing that we are not spotless, at least. That's good. The A index, for all, unless you're doing climatology, the A index is something you should ignore. Climatology doesn't really work for ham, ham radio. I can't stand the fact that this number is used in ham radio. It really should be ignored because all this is is simply the KP index averaged over a day, right? First of all, the KP index, which you're going to see right here, K equals one, that's the K index. And it, the P means planetary, so that's what PLNT or Y is. That K index, it's a global index. And what it, and it really works much better for, for mid-latitudes than at high latitudes. If you're a high latitude amateur radio operator, the K index probably means very little to you. Um, if you're mid-latitudes like in the United States, great. Uh, it's, it's, it works for you to some degree. It's a three hour averaged index. And basically what it indicates is how rattled the earth's magnetic shield is. So if you see this K, uh, go up to, let's say four. Okay. You could probably start having issues. Well, not start having issues. You've probably had issues for about three hours <laughs> because this is upgraded or updated every three hours. And by the time you first notice it, you're already three hours into the disturbance. So K isn't necessarily my great my my favorite index either. The best index to look at if you're going to look at K indices, look at a local magnetometer around your area. You can have a local K index of seven, and the planetary index, which is averaged all around the mid latitudes of the globe, will be three, so or four. So it doesn't necessarily tell you exactly how things what the conditions are in your locale, right, in your local area. A lot of people, that, that's a big misnomer. Uh, a lot of people like to believe that space weather is just a global phenomenon, but it really isn't. There are global parts of it, right? Because you have the sun launching these massive things at you. That can is a global kind of thing because when it hits Earth, it's going to hit Earth. But the impacts of space weather can be local, just like weather. So it really depends upon the kind of phenomenon that you're looking at as to where it hits and how long lasting those impacts are. And it really does matter what latitude and what local time you're at. 
So some of these numbers can be extremely misleading if you don't know where on the planet these numbers came from, right, and what they're talking about. Um, PTN flux, that's proton flux. Okay, why you need to see the proton flux for, and I don't think this is even energetic proton flux. I think this is just basically helping you understand the D, uh, the D layer, both the proton flux and the electron flux. Where you need to watch these for for differences, for you know, for I mean, excuse me, for impacts for you would be if the numbers change rapidly. So if this these numbers are only updated once a day, it's not going to help you all that much. That so flux will get you every know, time. Again. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just joking. What the flux are you talking about? I mean, okay, so, <laughs> the, okay, so now the aurora. All right, this N1.99 is always that right now. Paul has yet to update this. He says this is going to go away. This was when he actually used to do this aurora number as a scale from 1 to 10. And so he had to scale it. Really what he's reporting now or is going, I think he is already starting to report it. He's reporting aurora in gigawatts. Right now it's at one because there's basically no aurora, but this is probably coming straight from the ovation model. Um, for North Hemis Northern Hemisphere, I would say anything above about 30, 35 gigawatts. So if this number goes from one, it goes to 35. You might start getting auroral propagation around mid latitudes. Um, if you're up to 50, you'll definitely get auroral propagation, no problem. Uh, anything above that, if you get to 100, Step out of your ham shack and look up, look at the sky, <laughs> because if this gets to about a hundred, there there might be aurora above you, you know, um, it, easily in the United States. So hopefully that gives you an idea of what that is. The latitude, of course, it'll tell you the latitude how far down the aurora is coming. This is my, most likely a under, uh, you know, a conservative estimate, because we're learning that a lot of the models that we have with aurora really underestimate how visible the aurora is on the planet. Thank, thanks to social media, we're, we're, there are a lot more field reporters out there that are actually showing us how far the aurora reaches. Uh, and scientists have actually published papers on this now. Okay, um, so then BZ, that's how far southward the field is pointing. The bigger this gets, the more chance for uh, a, a geomagnetic storm, a, 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 the Earth responding, the Earth's magnetic shield to respond, and then of course K will go up. So really, if you want to look at this, if you see a negative number, because I'm sure it says negative. That's when you perk up your ears. If you see a negative five or high or below, right? Negative five, negative six on the way down, then really perk up your ears and take a look at this. This number here is the solar wind speed. If this is a rule of thumb, if this is below five, so negative, I mean, below negative five, right? Negative five or, or lower. And the solar wind speed is 400 or higher you've got a geomagnetic storm if it lasts, okay? You'll start noticing propagation issues on the radio long before this rises, okay? Because this is real-time data and it's getting it from our upstream monitors. Now, moving down here really fast and I'll just do this quickly. This to me is something that you probably can't pay attention to. Why? Because where is it telling you this stuff is, right? I mean, it's saying day or night, what, the entire globe, the entire day side of, the, of Earth, the 80 to 40 meter band is fair, the entire night side of the globe, 80 meter to, to 40 meters is good, I doubt it. Go down to low latitudes and you'll find that the equatorial anomaly will totally make 80 and 40 not propagate at all, right? It, it really depends upon um, where you are, what latitude you're at. So these kind of conditions, if, if you've ever watched this stuff and it doesn't seem to concert with where you are, it's because your local effects are taking over, where this is just not, it's not robust enough to give you, you, know, you, can, you, you space weather is not a global phenomenon when it comes to radio propagation, right? It'd be like saying, well, because it's raining in Southern California, it's obviously raining in Chicago. No, <laughs> no one would look at that and say, oh, yeah, of course it is. Of course it's raining. If it's raining in, in Milwaukee, it's going to be raining in Wisconsin. No, not true. No one questions that. So why would we think that this is okay, right? Radio propagation is fair in one locale doesn't mean it's going to be fair in another. So just be aware of that. Geomagnetic field, 
this is essentially the same kind of thing that we're talking about here, where is how rattled is the Earth's magnetic shield? It's just basically telling you in words whether or not we're having a storm. And if we've got a busy or noisy um, geomagnetic field, then um, we're going to be, you know, having issues with radio propagation, mainly on Earth's night side and on six meters and 10 meters mainly. Um, and then the noise level, again, where? Uh, MUF, the maximum usable frequency, they're talking about Boulder. I think this says no repeater, so they don't have a repeater right now that they're that they're pinging, maybe no ionosond or something that they're trying to look at. I don't know if that's going to be updated or not. And then solar flare probability is just how active are the sunspots on the Earth-facing disk. Right now they say there's only a 9% chance, and that's, that's going to change. That'll probably go up in the next couple of days because of the active regions that are going to be rotating into earth view here shortly. So hopefully that helps. Um, so so we all know you, we all know you've got a, you've got a picture of the sun somewhere that, that you can throw up there and show us what it looks like. Right. Yeah. Cause, cause you wouldn't be you if I, you didn't I have, don't the have a sun picture. Right I have a movie. That's I, ha I have a movie. Of the sun. <laughs> that's even more better to be, to be grammatical. Is that more better? <laughs>